Welcome to uh, another webinar of Crytek. Uh, today we're looking at uh, CryEngine and specifically the audio section of it. So before we start, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Florian Flüsselin, Audio Director at Crytek, uh, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to talk about this topic today. Um, to give you a little bit of overview, what we're going to do today. So, well, first of all, as a webinar, you're totally free to ask questions anytime via the chat. So, don't hold back, or yeah, or, yeah, we, we might get to it at the end, anyways. Or you just well, I, we moderate that stuff, so it's no worries. So, we're going to talk about uh, following topics within, I would say, about the next 30 minutes. It's um, about the audio translation layer, which is the core concept of CryEngine's audio. Um, the audio workflow from basic, ba sorry, basically both angles, uh, one of the audio designers as well as from a, from a game's perspective. Uh, the audio controls editor, this is like the big panel where everything comes together to be connected. Um, the default controls within that audio controls editor, the various audio entities which are available in CryEngine to uh, populate the world with, and a couple more um, audio trigger options via different tools like character editor, etc. So without any further ado, let's get started. Um, the next sheet is a little bit of preparation, so uh, bear with me. It is a lot of text, but don't, don't worry. So um, I will use the CryEngine, uh, the latest launcher version, to show uh, in-game elements. So in case you haven't done it yet, you know, please go to our website, cryengine.com, and get registered, download the latest engine. There is a package. We, um, I like to use uh, very often to showcase elements, which is the so-called free game SDK. Um, it's free assets you can download from the marketplace. Uh, very helpful to open various pack files from the engine is uh, an archiver software such as 7-zip, WinRAR, you name it. Um, and of course, all of this stuff I'm telling you is also available in form of a CryEngine documentation, which is online and you can find on the CryEngine, uh, on cryengine.com under the documentations tab. So let's start with the audio translation layer. Um, yeah, a little bit of an overwhelming picture, but it's it's pretty simple. So what is the audio translation layer? So the audio translation layer is in pretty much an abstraction between the Cry Engine and the respective audio middleware. Uh, audio middleware is so-called um, well audio engine, which normally audio people use to uh, to yeah to like like. Graphic people like to render their graphics. We like to render our audio, and uh, this is why we normally use third-party audio middlewares. Um, and the audio translation layer allows us to have, have a pretty agnostic approach which one we actually want to use. So if you follow that schematic here, um, basically the, the, it is the translating the signal sent from the game application into the format of the audio middleware implementations. So you see there's a signal coming from the game, going through various modules of CryEngine, and ends up in the translation layer, which then allows to, well, basically in runtime, even switch between various middlewares. Um, the good thing is it allows for a, hom a homogeneous solution to all game teams, in pretty much regardless of the choice of audio middleware. So that's the advantage to to make that a little more uh, easy to understand. So the if you look at the audio workflow of the audio translation layer. Um, so this one is the workflow from the game engine perspective. So there is a signal in form of an um, audio trigger uh, being sent to the audio translation layer from the game, like, for example, player has made a step. Um, then the audio uh, translation layer actually translates those signals into the respective format for the audio middleware um, and passes this along to the audio controls editor. And this one then performs the actual action which could be like, okay, player has made a step, therefore connect this with the play player footstep action. Or vice versa, this is more from a designer's perspective. Um, we have an audio source, like a recording or our footstep I just mentioned. Um, and this will be implemented into an audio middleware, including the behavior in form of uh, an audio action, like play this footstep. And this play action is available in the audio controls editor and will then be connected to the audio trigger um, to be executed by the game. So <clears throat> to, to basically enter the, 
the editor right now. Um, this is the audio controls editor as you as you can find it um, in the tool um, under the is it is it yeah it's tools tab yeah tools tab audio controls editor. Um, well, I can I can look it up here. So tools. Zzz, sorry about that. Audio controls editor. And if I dock that window in the middle, you're gonna see it looks exactly as in my PowerPoint presentation. Um, I, I stay with the PowerPoint as it is much more convenient for me to, to move forward, um, but we will end up in the editor in a, in a few minutes. So within the audio controls editor tool, we basically visually separate the audio triggers coming from the game from the available audio actions in the middleware. So in this case, if you on the left side of this um, audio controls editor, you see all available audio triggers and other ATL controls. Um, and also in this part, you will manage filter search through your audio controls. So all the left is basically the, the, the game side, everything which is generated from the game. And on the right side, you see the available audio actions and assets. And in this part, it's basically reading the structure of your audio middleware, or, well, in our following cases, we, uh, we're going to use the so-called SDL mixer in implementation, which is um, reading your SDL mixer folder within audio. So once you have a connection established between those two, um, this, this panel will show additional elements. Uh, where you can also define things like uh, basic pan panning, attenuation, volume, etc. So let me go back to the engine, show you that. So, so you can make a connection by <clears throat> basically drag and drop into the window. Oh, let me do that properly. Or by by first creating a respective trigger and then connecting it here. So as soon as you have made a connection, I, I could also go in and just drag and drop it. Then it would even generate it with the same name. But it's, that's more of a how you want to work and from which side you're approaching it, right? Is it more from an I got my assets ready, I want to hook it up, or is it more I want to get all the triggers first and don't worry about the assets. So once it's connected, you see that there are certain um, additional elements that are going to be available. Uh, for example, you have the you have a start or a stop. You can decide on whether that sound is supposed to start or stop. You can say whether it's a 2D sound, whether so it basically plays on the listener position, or you, if you enable the panning, it will be panning based on the entity's position in the world. Um, you can say whether there should be any roll-off and attenuation happen, so the sound gets quieter based on the distance between listener and emitter. Uh, you can set the overall volume, also quite important. Um, you can specify a minimum and maximum distance. This minimum distance basically means the sound will stay at maximum volume, you defined here, um, within that range. And after it hits that range, so let's say if you put a 5 in, it would stay at minus 23 dB until 5 meters, and then would start attenuating linearly until 100 meters have reached. You can define whether it is a one-off or one-shot, so it's like a sound happening once and then it's over, or whether it should loop or repeat by increasing the counter. So if I put 5 in, it would repeat 5 times and then stop, or I would just say, you know what, I want it infinite, so as soon as I hit start, it will play forever until I trigger a stop. Um, so as we were talking already a little bit about SDL mixer things, so the next slide is, um, so here you can see a screenshot. Um, if we change the audio implementation to Firelight's FMOD Studio, um, and maybe again also to give you the better understanding on how the audio controls editor works from a from a concept. Um, if you have a look between those two, despite the fact that I'm very bad in getting the same size of screenshot, but the left side doesn't change, right? The audio controls 
still exactly the same, but the right side, so our audio middleware has changed and is now completely looking differently, so you have different triggers and other elements available. Um, and the same if we go one step further, this one shows the audio controls editor if you have the implementation of audio kinetics wise enabled. And again, the left side, so the game stays completely the same from a trigger perspective, but the right side in terms of available audio assets is actually changing. So again, here's the another screenshot of what I just showed you with the distance attenuation, what we just discussed. Just to repeat on that, so yeah, once a connection has been established, it's the middle panel which uh, offers um, additional functionality, um, but this is based on the SDL mixer implementation, which is, let's say, a fairly straightforward one. So, um, for example, distance attenuations and looping behavior, if you look at Audio Kinetics Wise or FMOD Studio, uh, these things are defined in the respective events within the middleware, while SDL mixer is pretty much just a library of assets available, therefore the functionality of that stuff lives, lives in the audio controls editor. Um, one interesting thing is, um, as this is a very abstract system, um, we do like things to name the trigger the same as the asset, but that ha that is there is no reason for it rather than us wanting to know what the hell is going on, right? If everything would be named new trigger one two three four five six, you pr you lose the the overview fairly quickly. So having a solid naming convention in place is always helpful. But in fact, um, I could name this new trigger, and I could I could add multiple sounds to it, right? So th I think that's very interesting from a design perspective. So you can have multiple connections per audio control. It's either to increase granularity on the audio you're using, um, <clears throat> or you use the same audio control to drive additional parameters out of one audio control. So for example, you could attach, um, I don't know, a different reverb based on the environment or a different real-time parameter to that audio control so if I if I trigger that particular new trigger, then it plays my three things plus additional stuff. In our case, the SDL mixer doesn't allow for a lot of these functionalities, but other middlewares like Wise and FMOD Studio do. Excuse me. Um, so this is a very helpful thing. So let's let's imagine we have not dialogue as we have in this case, but well, I can show another trigger maybe. Yeah, so we have a we have in Woodlands we have our trigger here. It's the crash site. It has the um, it has the ambience connected, and it has a bug, which is the loop flag is missing. Um, we could say now, oh, you know what? I want to have I want to have a little bit of forest in there too. So I just add my forest to it. So whenever this trigger is being executed now, well, I can say that. As soon as it's being executed, it will play both at the same time. I could start mixing it by you know, altering the volume of one. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility and granularity uh, in how you want to structure your assets. So, yes, audio controls. So, as you have, as you, you've seen me like adding um, like audio triggers. Um, basically, the, there are five audio controls plus the folder and I, I quickly step through them. So you, you get to them by um, audio controls to a right click and add. In this case it just allows a folder within a folder. It allows everything or you hit the add button at the top right of the left panel. Um, to not distract with too much stuff, back to PowerPoint. So those five are basically the trigger um, which is a container that executes all the controls connected to them. So as you've just seen, like if there's two connected, it will execute both of them. They can be so they can be any number of files can be grouped into a single trigger. Um, what we haven't looked at, um, but we might do in, a, in the future if we talk more about the uh, middleware specific implementations. Um, so an RTPC is basically a real-time parameter control, and it's it's something used to seamlessly alter a parameter's value on which the audio middleware can receive and drive corresponding effects. So I think a very good example of that would be player speed, 
right? So we ask the game to output an RTPC called player speed. Uh, this player speed is in, let's say, meter per second uh, and it ranges from 0 to 10. Um, and while the player is moving, it constantly updates that parameter so the middleware can pick up on it and, let's say, pitch the sound accordingly up or down based on the speed you have. Um, another, <coughs> sorry, another audio control is the switch. And switches contain any number of states which can be set by a code or flow graph. Um, here a good example would be the surface type uh, for character footsteps. So we would go in and say, hey, we, we make a check, we make a raycast on where's the character walking and we get the callback from the surface type saying, I'm on concrete. And we pass on this um, value or um, switch by saying, hey, I'm walking on, uh, on the concrete surface. Um, and by this, alter the footstep based on based on this. Um, environment um, defines areas, um, so it's used in conjunction with an area box, area shape, area sphere, or area solid. It allows to drive an effect based on this area. Um, I think the prime example here would be, in fact, reverb. So, so we say as long as the listener is in that environment, um, you play this particular reverb to it. Again, it is similar as switch and RTPC. It is an advanced functionality, which unfortunately the SDL mixer does not um, does not have, but other middlewares do. Uh, preload is a request uh, to load audio-specific files into memory. Um, yeah, it can be used from flow graph or or level triggers. Um, again, any number of files can be grouped into a single request. It just makes handling audio data in a real-time running game uh, much easier. And last but not least, the folder is no is no control, but simply helps you to keep the overview um, about the various triggers. Because again, if we so this is just the game SDK, um, and you see it it already contains a fair amount of examples. If you yeah imagine a full-blown project uh, can go out of hand fairly quickly, so. I can only recommend using naming convention. Uh, stay tight, even if you're the only one working on this. Um, at least I know my brain after, you know, ask me a week later and I, I can't recall what I did the week before. So having this, it's always helpful as it, keep, it keeps yourself organized. And even if you come back to it a month later, you know exactly what, what happened. So moving on. Yes. Oh, yeah. Default controls, and uh, let's uh, let's go back to Sandbox Editor in, in a in a second. Um, so to have a very clean start, um, and maybe you want to come along with, we we basically gonna gonna um, empty uh, the audio pack now from the project folder, and um, so therefore I, I gonna close I gonna close the Sandbox, and we'll go to my respective asset folder, which you can reach through the CryEngine launcher. Well, I can throw that over. So if you if you go to Game SDK and say Reveal in Explorer, then this is what happens. If you go to Assets, um, there is an audio folder already, but normally it's not. And also, the, the only thing you're going to see is the audio pack. Don't, don't worry about the other folders. So what we're going to do now, we're going to open the audio pack with one of the archiver softwares you have installed. In that case, um, it's 7-zip, and I'm going to extract the audio. After that, I'm going to, in this case, delete it, but if you don't want to download it again, I don't know, move it, move it, move it up a couple folders. Um, as the CryEngine is first reading the, um, it's always reading from the asset folder, and it has a priority normally, which is first the unpacked folder, then refer back to packed file, and in our case, we want to slim down, so we basically will remove fmod wise and ace, which is, is the audio controls editor, so we have a really clean start. Whoop, and the only thing remaining is the SDL mixer, and to also not convolute ourselves too crazy, I will keep I will keep the concrete 
walk, I will use one, <coughs> sorry, one forest ambience. Um, and maybe some chicken. Do we have chickens somewhere? Well, I will, I will use multiple. I will also take this forest and open ground just because I can. And oh yeah, let's use bird fly off. That's good. Yeah, so that's the one I'm gonna throw out real quick and then I'll delete the rest. And I move it back in. So, what happens now if we go back we go back to starting the engine this is basically like a like a new project and this is how it opens up now so you're going to see only the default controls and you're going to see whatever is in the STL mixer which is our asset assets audio STL mixer so it's monitoring that stuff if I dare to move the birds out and I hit reload oops it's gone vice versa if I add more stuff to it and hit reload it's back so you can basically stay the, with the editor open just populate your folders um, so to talk about the default controls a little bit, um, it's not scary at all. It's um, it's just these controls are provided by the engine and are created automatically as they are game project independent or required for the editor. So straightforward is um, if I look at sorry. Oh, yeah. If I add the the audio buttons in the upper toolbar, um, you see uh, stop all sounds, mute audio, and refresh audio. Refresh audio is just reloading the audio uh, in the engine. Um, mute audio is, for example, the same for mute all and unmute all. So these two controls are not connected to any audio per se. They're just there to give that functionality provided from the engine. Um, it also goes along with um, the ignore window focus. So there is a C bar where you can, you know, as soon as you tap out of CryEngine, all the sounds from CryEngine will obviously stop, and you can override that by setting the C bar, which then will also not mute. Or object Doppler, object speed, uh, something provided by engine calculation to start with. Uh, get focus, lose focus is exactly the the things I mentioned. With if you have if you have the grind gen in the window focus or not. Do nothing is a fallback, also provided by the engine. So don't worry too much about that. Leave the default controls. Um, yeah, rather start. Uh, yeah, let's say I don't know. Let's say grind gen audio. So we give it a name, and then we. We could start populating it. So, just checking. Yeah, that that I've done. Exactly. So, but of course, let's say we can prep all this here by throwing this in. So that means we have five nice triggers with audio connected now. Um, but we have to populate a game world, right? So in that case. Um, we go back to the perspective tab, or we just make a new level. And we call it CryEngine Audio. And we load it. Because that will help us to, um, to identify a little bit the audio entities. So audio entities are obviously under um, the audio tab and we're using them to drag and drop them into the level or selecting them from the create objects tab and we can use them to populate the world with so as you've probably looked at a new level is sometimes a little bit hard to navigate so before I do this 
I will uh, use the designer real quick and uh, drop in a box to sorry yeah we'll scan it uh, get it a little bigger well I'll make it a little bigger overall so we we can fly back here and find our way probably also covered another tutorial but uh, use the middle mouse button to adjust your camera speed you see that slider a little bit always helpful um, so the first entity we're going to look at is the simple one which is the audio triggers bot so it is one of these nice entities with a with a speaker symbol and if you select it oops sorry he said layout um, yeah you can give it a name same applies here as well try to also come up with a naming convention like I don't know ATS for audio trigger spot uh, my first sound so if we select this one here um, in the lower part so these are going to close as they not um, a lot of these so all of these entities share a lot of elements which not necessarily are important for audio you know, like the audio trigger doesn't need to receive wind. It's just a little bit of, let's say, legacy as CryEngine is just throwing those automatically at all entities. But the important ones are in the entity properties. Um, and there, for example, it says play trigger name. And what the play trigger name will do is if we re-link our controls editor, it will give us access to the created audio triggers. So again on everything we have created on the left side um, so going back here and selecting it will exactly show the left side of our audio controls editor and I will be able to say I want this sound to play In this case birds fly off is, is something um, and also to visualize it we're going to use a C bar which is called S draw and if you tab it it will be autocomplete and in this case just A will be enough so with this information you're going to see the version of the SDL mixer up there and of course if I now hit the play you're going to see the little red dot appearing from the entity do that again Right. So the audio, <coughs> sorry. So the audio trigger spot also comes with uh, some funny functionality, which is you can have a max and min delay. So I could say yes, I want to have it to play random. Uh, let's put five and three seconds, and then I enable it and I play random. So what's going to happen now? It will automatically re-trigger. Or not? <laughs> no, it should. Just one second. Enable min max. Did I do that wrong? Minimum delay three seconds. Watch. Put it. Try again. Oh yeah, now it works. So we first have to flag the play random and then the enable. I did it the other way around. That's why it didn't pick up on it immediately. So you need to re-trigger it with the enable. So now it will basically keep continuing playing, but re-trigger it. Let's uh, turn that off. Um, and this also can be randomized in terms of positions. At the moment, we're still playing it from that particular entity position. We could also say, "Hey, please, please randomize it on the in the in the axis." And this will be specified in the radius. So I can say within two meters uh, on the x-axis. And you see, based from the entity position, it will now find a random spot on the x-axis to play from some somewhere between zero meters and the maximum value and we'll continue that so by this you can also randomize the sound around your entity position a little bit let's unflag that so the next thing on the create objects tab in the audio is uh, an audio area ambience 
and the audio area ambience, what it needs is an area connected. Um, areas you can find under area and uh, audio supports uh, box, sphere, solid and shape while most common to use I'd say is box, sphere and shape. Area solids are really cool too as they, they allow really really complex and detailed ways to build areas but of course it takes a little longer to build them so uh, for, for showcasing I'm just going to use a sphere so I will select it and drag the sphere uh, onto, onto my little designer item here. Um, then I will go back to audio and um, audio area ambience and as you can see at the moment it, there's nothing really happening. I already name it AAA. Uh, I don't know, forest. I will already select a play trigger which opens again um, the audio controls editor and I will say hey play me the the ambient forest here. Uh, I don't want to specify an environment for now and we leave that as is but at the moment it's not doing anything as it is not connected to this area right so I select my area and I will go here to attached entities which is the very bottom of the properties and say add which will make me allow to pick an entity and now you see it is connected. So before we do this um, we will go back to our audio controls editor to check something because while in ambience in a forest I want to make sure that it has no panning enabled as I want to hear it in all speakers. Um, it should be enabled and I want to match the distance with the distance of the entity because you see there is an RTPC distance and an environment distance. Environment distance means that this is the distance in meters in which the audio still will, uh, the environment will still start to fade in and the same happens with the RTPC distance so the sound will start five meter before the area starts and will fade in obviously that should match with the maximum distance of the attenuation so otherwise if there's a mismatch there will be nothing happening until five meters and then the sound will thup, plop in and play in the volume of a five meter right so what we're going to do we, we, we make a 25 so it should roll off in 25 meters and we will use the very same value here we say it's going to be a loop please because we don't want to have it to stop um, yes so now you see that there's the sound already appearing right if I go away more than 25 meters it will stop let me let me slow that down a bit if I yeah if I'm out, so if I'm outside, it will stop. If I hit the 25 meter radius, it will start, but of course it will be very quiet, but technically playing. Let me see whether I can increase that by adding some more CVOS. Yeah. And now as I go closer, you see the sound gets louder and sticks to the edge of the area. So if I go around it will always play from the nearest or closest to that sphere. And if I go inside it will stick to to the listener and travels with it. In this case there is only an attenuation so you, you won't hear it from the left or the right as I haven't panning enabled if I if I did um, then that would be audible as well hmm. I think I have to fly out then so, yes so now 
when I'm flying back in, now it should come from one or the other side. There's also another randomization you can use in conjunction with area spheres, area boxes, or area shapes, or respectively, or area solids as well. We do have so-called audio area random. Um, and the audio area random is similar as the audio trigger spot randomization, has basically the same functionality. It has a, it has a trigger, it has a radius. The big, sorry, the big difference is that not the entity defines its position, similar as the audio area ambience. The entity doesn't really matter. It is the shape attached to it. And the same happens here. So if we go in and select our area again and tell it to, hey, add me some more stuff, in this case, our audio area random, which I call AAR, and I call it, I don't know, test. Um, Then we have it, oh, let's, let's move it out a bit just so you guys see the connection. So this one is connected now to this area as well. And if I go in and say, okay, now um, play, me, play me the bird fly off thing again, it will play from the entity's position the first time. Yeah, exactly. Okay, it will play, if I'm outside the area, it will play on the radius around it. As soon as I go in, it will stick with me and again use the radius. So maybe 10 meters is a bit very, it's, it's a bit much compared to that the area is very small. So now you see there's a random on a disk around me. It's hard to catch. I you say, yeah, it's happening. So. So you can use that as well to let's say spice up your ambience. So you have your basic loop, like let's say a forest wind or something, and you just want to have additional birds being spawned randomly around the player as long as you move in that particular area. Um, <clears throat> let me catch up on the PowerPoint just to see whether I got. Yeah, here's again like the collection of the shapes. Um, that's another example with just a box. Then the audio area random we just had. So um, let me talk real quick about FlowGraph in that matter. So everything in CryEngine, or well, not everything, but almost everything has um, a representing element in our script, script uh, scripting language. So FlowGraph is CryEngine's visual scripting tool, and it allows to define a game logic to uh, triggers or entities uh, in the game environment. So all of our audio entities we've just been looking at um, have obviously a representation in that flow graph manner and can be manipulated in real time based on this. So for example, for this audio trigger spot, I can create a flow graph and uh, just call it audio. So it will automatically open my flow graph window. I just docked this as well. Um, and it now has the ATS, my first sound, connected. And I will, oh, I had it selected. And I will say, add selected entity. And you're going to see, I'm going to zoom in. You see that this is my audio trigger spot again. Um, and it, it basically has the disabled and enabled uh, checked here. So if I, if I want, I can tell it, let me, let me turn those off to not confuse. So let's say we have this one not enabled and what we're going to do we want as soon as the player jumps into game or the game starts so we just go and say game start uh, create a, a flow graph and say if that happens you, you're going to enable that entity. Um, so what's happening now is that if I did it all correct, I jump into game, ow, and you saw this one starts playing. You can do the randomization again, so just, so again, yep.
So as soon, so it's just I defined a condition. As soon as the game starts, start playing this. Um, as you saw on this list, there are plenty, plenty of other conditions um, you can apply to trigger or alter sounds. It could be in, in proximity trigger in the game, um, you name it. So, so I'm, I can only encourage you to play around with that. Or game tokens is something very often used. Um, let me check. Wow. So, CryEngine is offering, well, of course, the entities I just shown you and a little bit of flow graph and, and scripting opportunity. Um, but many of the character or other tools in general are providing audio trigger functionality built in. So, if I, for example, open the character tool and also dock this. Talk this here and uh, tell it to open, let's say, animals, deer. I'm going to load a deer now. Um, then we can select an animation. Oh, yeah, here we go can select an animation, and as you can see, um, we could we could set audio triggers, and again select um, from our audio controls. In this case, I I don't have any step. Oh no, I have the concrete walk. So I just assign the concrete walk to it, zip, and as there are multiple steps in there, I just repeat that. Sorry about that, quick. And now you can see that based on whenever whenever that animation hits a certain, it's, it's a trigger point, you can double click and just add an audio trigger. Um, it, will, it will start playing that that sound, so the advantage is you can basically stay in sync with your animation and trigger sound according to the animation. Or what else we have as, as a nice tool to where audio functionality is uh, happening. So we have, I don't know, particle editor. It's also something, let's say fireworks, right? So this is, uh, yeah, the particle editor, well, everything which all the effects are being specified, and we can, we can now go in, oops, there are some buttons, there seem to be some buttons disappearing, let me load that again, it's prob if there's something like that happening, that's probably already fixed in the next update coming. Uh, let me just do that again. Fireworks. Ah, here we go. So we can now, on the drop down next to the um, to the upper right, you can see like the trigger, and you can set an audio trigger. And if you extend it, you can specify the functionality on spawn or on death of that particle. Then obviously you can again say, hey, if that fireworks go off, I want to have my nice bird fly off sound. Um, and you can say whether it should follow the particle emitter or just spawn from wherever that particle entity is being placed. Um, you, you might have seen it a lot. Uh, occlusion um, is about raycasting whether there's anything in the way between the listener and the emitter. So basically, if I go to have your hand not in front of your mouth and you start putting your hand on your mouth, it becomes muffled. So that's the, um, the effect we're simulating with that. Or last but not least, as a another one is track view, um, which is our cinema cinematic 
Do we have an example loaded here? Open. Oh, apparently not. Well, we're going to get to that maybe in one of the next sessions. Uh, but also track view is like a cinematic tool. Oh, it did do it. Sorry. Import file from. What did I do? Um, in the end, track view is nothing else than a linear um, cinematic tool where you basically say, I want to define a, a specific camera movement to that, uh, to that scene. Um, and we also have the functionality to trigger audio alongside. So whenever it hits a certain, certain point in that track view sequence, it will execute on that audio trigger. So to round it up a bit, right? there are multiple editors uh, tools which we provide with audio functionality. Um, track view, unfortunately, I, I have to check why I couldn't find the, the proper one. Maybe I was missing it in that build. Um, but yeah, we uh, we're gonna talk about that I think in a in the near future uh, in a in a follow up webinar as each of those tools um, provide more functionality than just audio triggers um, and it's always good to focus solely on that. So yeah, I open up for questions if there aren't any so far. Uh, please feel free to to poke. And I got the first one so. Kevin asks, uh, can we use any of the OGG files that we created ourselves in CryEngine, assuming that we cannot use MP3 format? Can we? So um, SDL Mixer is having a limitation as MP3 is not supported. It supports WAV file in 16-bit uh, 48 kilohertz or OGG. Um, and to answer your question, yes, you can. Um, of course, the, the assets which we ship with free game SDK, um, you know, we're totally happy to use them for just testing stuff. But um, of course, uh, there's a little bit of a legal uh, thing. We cannot just give you that for, for, for free to use in another commercial product. But as long as you're playing around with it, feel free to use them. Uh, or you create yourself, exactly. And uh, you just convert them to OGG. There, there are plenty of free software which does drag and drop wave to OGG. Um, yeah, and you just uh, so there's no reason to not use WAV files, but of course OGG is much smaller um, as they are getting stored. Does, I hope that answers your question. 